You may be seated. Now comes a time in our service where we look at announcements and prayer concerns. This Wednesday, Bible study is canceled and it will resume next Wednesday at 6.30. Greg Coy is working through the book of Job. So if you have interest in Bible study, don't come this week, come next week. Um, also the state hospital, we announced last week, this, this program starts Thursday, December 7th at six o'clock. There are information handouts in the back of what we can bring, what we can do. Um, if you guys haven't been to this before, it's like a giant Christmas party. Um, there's some celebrity guests that may or may not show up and it's just a fun time. And so if you have any questions, you can reach out with Pat, but please mark your schedules. This is a really good way to show some people the light of Christ in like the Christmas season in such a fun way. So please consider joining us on December 7th at six at the Madison State Hospital. Also, it's almost Thanksgiving, if you didn't know, and we figured the turkey population is going to take a hurting next week. And so on Sunday, the 26th, which is next Sunday, we're going to have an Italian dinner here at church instead of Thanksgiving. So we'll have, you know, meatballs, whatever you guys want to bring, um, all kinds of breads. We will also be having family pictures. And so invite your family um, to come get some pictures taken. And also we'll be decorating for Christmas, which is my personal favorite. But that'll all be happening next Sunday after church. So please come, please bring your favorite dish, and let's just have some fellowship together. Also, OB Rangers, I've been announcing this for a while. This is a kiddos group that gets together and learns about Jesus. And this week, they helped color some scriptures and some encouraging words, and they put them in what we called blessing bottles. We've done blessing bottles in the past. This is just the bottles in the your right behind you, uh, beside the shoe boxes. They're just water bottles. Um, they have some stuff in them. They have a dollar in them. And they also have little blankets in them. And the idea behind this is when you're out and about and you see someone on the street that's asking for money or maybe whatever it is, someone who just looks like they're in need, this is an opportunity where you can just give them this bottle and just let them know that someone's thinking about them. These bottles have all been prayed over and we just pray that they're a blessing to whoever receives them. So there are 20 in the back if you would like to take one. There are also more coming. So once again, please feel free to take those in the back. On the other side, there's a yellow sign that says pantry items. On the back table, there's like chips and kid snacks and some t-shirts. There are things that if you know someone in need this Thanksgiving season, take that stuff or if you're in need yourself, take some of that and give it away. Um, it's on the back table, it says pantry items. Feel free to take whatever you need from that table. Also two camp announcements. Bethlehem Nights is a drive through event at the Southeastern Baptist Youth Camp in Westport, which is the one we go to. And this will be on December 15th and 16th. Um, and this is just an opportunity to sit in your car, drive around, look at some Christmas lights and a, a nativity scene. Um, so please put this on your schedule for the 15th and 16th to try to attend this. Also, Jaquita wanted me to bring up that if you're planning for 2024, which just blows my mind that we're already here, um, to look at the camp schedule online. Our church takes the kiddos in July every year, and it's an awesome camp, and we're going to keep doing that. But the camp in general has a lot of different camps you can go to. I know the Crawls went to the family one, I think. Did I just lie? <coughs> Good. Um, and there's ones for like kindergartners. There's a paintball camp. I think they have the golf camp. And so check out their website and just see if there's anything that might interest you or your family. And that would be on the Southeastern Baptist Youth Camp page. If you have questions about camp, Jaquita is our go-to and feel free to reach out to Jaquita. Also, as I announced earlier, the PHI helicopter is coming. Um, in fact, it should be landing now. Um, I just want to thank Randy C. for coordinating all of this. Um, he just loves the kids and loves them to know about safety, and so that's how all of this started. Um, we're taking the kids out during service, although it looks like all of them have our, almost all of them have already left, which is great. Um, adults. <laughs> I shouldn't say it like that, should I? Um, adults, you guys can go after service. The church is, or the church, the helicopters, the church is here forever. The, the helicopter is going to stay for 20 minutes after service, 20, 30 minutes. So you guys can check it out, see what it's about. Um, Johnny Collins is one of the main people out there, and he loves to talk about this and just educating people. And so feel free to check that out after service. Um, and if there's any high school students left in here, if you guys could help with the road when we go out there, that would be amazing. So that's the announcements for today. 
Uh, the prayer list for today, you guys may have seen it in the text. We wanted to add the Shoemaker family. This is of the 16-year-old boy who passed away in a car accident this week, so we pray for peace over his family. Also, there, we wanted to add Ashton Laker. He was hunting in a tree stand yesterday and fell out. I believe he's 13 years old. He broke both of his femurs, which are really hard to break, and he had some brain bleeding. Um, and we haven't had an update on him, but we just want to pray over that situation. Um, <laughs> to be 13 and break both of your femurs is no fun, so we pray over him. Um, also, we wanted to add Dylan Sullivan as he's healing from a surgery. Um, also, Amanda Kroll went to urgent care this morning. Did you hear anything from her? Okay. She's got an antibiotic, but she, okay. she just called. She's, okay. she's doing okay. All right, so she's just got an infection, so we'll continue to pray for her. Also, last week we added Donald Dye for his prostate cancer, along with Carolyn Banta, who has broken an ankle. Um, we added Debbie Hensley Rand, who is in hospice care, and I haven't got an update on her at all. Um, we keep praying for the Rook family um, as they are. Are they on hospice care, Sandy? The Rooks? Hospice, yeah. They're both in hospice. Okay. Is he? Okay. Okay, so we'll continue to pray for them. Thank you for that update. Also, Erin did give us an update on Zoe. It looks like all things are improving. She had baby Nova and then had the issues with the blood clots. It looks like the blood clot situation is getting better. So praise God for that and the fact that baby Nova is home and doing great. But we um, are glad that things are going better for Zoe too. Also, how's Marilyn? Uh, she's, she's home. Good. been doing a lot of doctor visits, so um, we know she has aortic stenosis, so she has to have tapper valve, I think I said that right, and we've met with those doctors, but there's, uh, it's a long process, they said it's a marathon, not a sprint, so we've got to do that, and that's the step first, and then they're going to work on some other things, so um, she's got physical therapy this week, just to try to get a little stronger, nine days in the hospital, out of somebody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll continue to pray for her. Thank you. Thank you. Also, April Johnson had a biopsy this week, and I did not hear what the update of that was, but we'll continue to pray over her. Results in, oh, results in a week. So we'll continue to pray over April in peace in the waiting. Um, also, we added Lynn Lozier. She fell and broke her wrist. She has osteoporosis too, which means healing isn't great. So we want to continue to pray for her. We've been praying for Morris and Judy as Morris had his back surgery and has the heart issues. Um, also, there's just a lot of people on our list who are battling cancer, um, from Corey Johnson to Mona Crabtree, uh, Nick Kalele, Bob Markham, Michelle Scott, Rob Furnish, and Rob Ronnie Morton, excuse me, Sam Copeland and Bonnie Simon. Um, I haven't gotten updates on some of them in a while, but we continue to pray for them in this longer haul. Um, we did get the update last week that Tim Gabbert brain aneurysm and strength is getting better, so praise God for that. Um, Brian Day is home from the, having a stroke and being in the nursing home, but we continue to pray for him. Um, Eddie Haskell was having gallbladder issues last week. Yes. Yeah. He is home. Good. And he is uh, doing better. Good. So thank you all so much for your prayers. Oh, of course. Um, and then just an update on me. The hard stuff is going to stay, so just give me grace as I'm short of breath. They wanted to put me on some medicines that would impact baby, and I'm not willing to do that. So I'm just going to be short of breath for a while. Um, but Ian and I, Ian has nothing to do with this, actually. I have a scan this week. That's a really big scan. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Um, so I have placenta privia and what's called marginal cord insertion. Not a huge deal. Could be, but this scan will tell us if baby's going to come early or not. Um, we still have some time, but I'll take prayers just that baby's growing how it should and that things are moving. Um, I would rather not have a C-section if I don't have to, but we'll do, we'll do what, what comes at us. So that's where we're at. Um, also, we pray for Pat every week as he leads our church family. 
We do have a lot of people not here today. I know the um, Fellowship of Christian Athletes group went to Seven Hills through Switzerland County and um, for this service, but also just for that group in general. I think they're doing really cool things in Switzerland County, so I want to continue to pray over FCA. Do we have any additions or updates to our prayer list? Oh, Debbie, yeah. Um, Bill Jones, my neighbor, who some may remember, he played Santa Claus at the state hospital a few times. Um, he's having surgery on his back this week. He had a car wreck like about a month ago. So prayers for him. Okay, so Bill Jones is having a back <coughs> surgery this week after a car accident about a month ago. Good. Anything else? A praise is Alex and little babies here. So cute. We're glad you're here. We prayed for you guys. All right, friends, won't you go uh, to prayer with me this morning? God, we thank you for this day that we get to just come here to freely and openly worship you. We thank you for the PHI helicopter coming and the kids being excited and just getting a new experience. We want to take a moment this morning to thank you for the names on this prayer list. Uh, we thank you because we know that you know them and we can have peace and assurance that you are working through whatever situation they're in. Lord, we want to take a moment this morning and just pray for the new people we add for Bill Jones and his upcoming surgery. Um, also for Ashton Laker, who fell out of the tree sand. Um, for those who are healing from surgeries, for Amanda and her infection, Lord, we just thank you that for the people on this list who have kind of the longer term diagnoses like cancer and Parkinson's disease, we know that you have them in your hand, Lord, and we continue to pray that your peace and blessing, and if it's in your will, your healing be upon them. We just ask that you be with the families during this time, um, and also for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we ask that your spirit, your Holy Spirit be in this place this morning, that you work through Pat and through the words that he says that we would be touched and we would be changed and made new because of you. We just pray that our hearts would be open and our ears would be willing to receive what you have today as we sing your worship and praise that you deserve and as we worship you together as a church family. It's in your name we pray. Amen. People's hands. But um, um, with that, uh, I'm going to warn everyone right off the top this morning that uh, there is some background um, that I'm going to provide today that might seem a little tedious, um, but if you stick with me, because in the end it helps make sense of all of this, uh, not only this week, but next week, um, uh, I, uh, uh, this, this week's sermon will bleed into next week's sermon. So, um, uh, but, so you're going to get a lot of background both this week and, and a little bit more next week. But uh, just uh, hang with me because it all makes sense in the end. Um, but, uh, but with that, we, we start this morning... Uh, with a basic question that carries with it multiple answers. And, and that question is, what is the church? What, what is the church? And, and you may answer that with, well, it's this building, or it's that building across the parking lot, or, or you might say that we are the church, the, the living, breathing organism of God. And in different ways and in different stages, you would all be right, in, in your answers. But, but through biblical history, there has been this shift in, in church and, and people's perceptions of church. And, and hopefully we can make it all a little bit more clear, not only this morning, but, but next week as well. Um, and with that, our first scripture today is a familiar one. It's, it's one that, that I've spoken about many times, and, and it's so good that I, I, I want to talk about it again. So uh, um, it's found in the Gospel of Matthew, if you have your Bibles, um, uh, chapter 16, uh, and we'll begin in verse uh, 13. So uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you, this scripture will be up on the screens. But uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, um, we find this account of Jesus speaking as it's recorded in Matthew. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for it was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the king, keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So ends the reading of God's word. Join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for this day. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And, and Father, I just ask that, that all things that we do glorify you, that we would continue to be a light in a, in a dark world, that, that that light would shine people towards you, not necessarily just toward us. Father, we love you, and we ask these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. It's a familiar moment in biblical history, right? You, like I said, you've heard me talk about this before. Uh, in my mind, I have always seen this picture where Jesus and his disciples are sitting around kind of this campfire in the middle of the night. And, and the only light that's being illuminated is that fire as they all sit in the dark and they've all leaned back and, and they're having this conversation. And... They, they're talking about the last few days uh, and, uh, and what's been going on. And, and in the verses prior to this, um, if you have your Bibles open, in, in, like said, there's, this is the background. In the verses prior to this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they want something from Jesus. In the last couple of days before we get to this moment, um, they, there's this conversation going on and, and these Jewish leaders, these church people, um, they, they want something from Jesus. They, they want him to give them a sign. They want him to do something that proves he is the Messiah. You say you're the Messiah, they say earlier in this chapter, but, but you need to show us, you need to, you need to prove to us that you are. And Jesus responds that in the evening, he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, He's, in the evening, you look up and you see red skies and you come to the conclusion that the weather is going to be good the next day. But when, they, when you get up in the morning and you see red skies, you come to the conclusion that a storm is coming. And today, you, you've heard the expression, right? Uh, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning or some version of that. I've heard that since I was a little kid. And... Uh, uh, so now you know where it came from. It, so Jesus tells here in, in Matthew 16, he uses that example. And he's making this point. He says to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, like I said, those, those Jewish religious leaders, basically you don't need to feel the rain and the wind to come to the conclusion that there's going to be a storm, right? You analyze what's around you. You, you, what you are seeing happen. And you compare that with those experiences that you've had, what's, what's happened in the past when you see those same conditions. In the past, when you've looked out at night and you've seen the sky be a color of red, you, you, you come to the conclusion that the next day the weather's going to be really good. And if you wake up in the morning and you look out and the sky is red, you come to the conclusion based on what you have seen in the past that the weather's not going to be so good that day. You don't have to wait until it rains. You don't have to wait to feel the rain hitting you. You don't have to wait to feel the, the wind blowing through you to come to the conclusion that you're going to have bad weather because of what you've experienced in the past and what you've seen around you. So with that, Jesus in these opening verses, he asks them a pretty simple question. Why do you need to see a physical sign from me? You've been following me around. I mean, if you, if you read through Scripture, Jesus and we always talk about Jesus and his disciples are all walking around. But, but in truth, there's always Pharisees and Sadducees in all of these pictures, and they're all trying to trap, you know, trap him, trip him up. 
He basically says, you've been following me around. What, what conclusions do you draw from your experience? If, if every night you see red sky, you come to the conclusion based on your experiences that it's going to be nice tomorrow. You've been following me around. You've seen all these experiences. What conclusion do you come to? He basically says, all the evidence is around you, you just have to accept that evidence. And with that, Matthew says that Jesus says those things and then it's, he says he left them and he walked away. Kind of that biblical mic drop, right? It says he goes across the lake with his disciples and then he has this discussion with them about be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, if you read in those scriptures before that, uh, he, he says basically that, be on guard against the yeast, Y-E-A-S-T, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when he tells them that on the other side of the lake, they come to the conclusion that he's mad at them because they didn't bring bread, right? Right? He must be mad because we did not bring some physical nourishment to eat while we're here and it's the middle of the night. And true to their nature, they're wrong. Jesus says, don't you guys remember anything that you've seen and anything that you've experienced? Now he's not talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's talking to them. All of those people that we fed with the lunch of a kid. I'm not talking about bread. I'm, I'm talking about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus says. Guard against taking what they teach to heart. I'm not talking about something physical. I'm talking about something spiritual. Spiritual. Because they're really loud. And if you listen, and they're so convicted in what they're saying that you could very easily decide that maybe I ought to listen to them a little bit more. Maybe what they're saying because they're so loud is right. Maybe I should pause here for a moment and and consider what they're saying. And today, I think we all need to pause for a moment and think about the people in our lives whose opinions and whose statements can be yeast for us. People who are so driven that they what they believe is right and suddenly you've gone down that same path. And their opinion begins like yeast in flour to grow and spread in you and around you. Well, they must be right because they're so loud. They must be right because they have such conviction. And Jesus looked at his disciples that night around that fire, and I believe he looks at us today and he says, everything around you you have seen should draw you to a conclusion. You don't need a physical sign. And all of those other people who are out there wandering around, don't let what they say grow in you. And while it grows, it moves and diminishes what I've shown you. Don't let the opinions of the wrong people be yeast and grow and cause feelings and thoughts to grow in you. You know better. And the disciples then and us now, we cannot allow that to happen. As followers of Christ, we know the one true voice, right? 
Jesus says in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. He says, my sheep know my voice. Now a little context for that. There would be shepherds out in the fields and they would all have their sheep out there and those sheep would all intermingle. And at the end of the night, when it came time to put them back in their sheep herd, um, their, their fenced-in area, to protect them from the things that go on in the night, the shepherds literally would call their sheep, and their, their sheep, and mixed in with all of those others, they knew the voice of their shepherd. And they would leave that mixed-up group, and they would follow their shepherd into their safety. And Jesus says the same thing. In the midst of all of these voices, my sheep not only know my voice, but they listen to my voice. In the midst of all of the other things going around, when I speak, they know it. Not only do they know it, but they follow it. And because they know my voice and because they follow my voice, I give them eternal life, he says. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. They're mine. Because they know my voice and they follow my voice. And all of that brings us back to this moment and those disciples sitting there and Jesus, I get this picture in my head, leans in toward the fire and he asks them a question. Who do people say I am? He asks them. And they're very willing to answer that question. <coughs> well, there are people who say you're John the Baptist. One of them answers. And that's a little weird since Jesus and John the Baptist were alive at the same time. You actually, there were people who saw them together at the same time. Um, they're second cousins, by the way, and we'll get to that at Christmas. Um, people would have seen them together, but there are still people, you know, John is, John is dead at this point. And they're like, well, there are people who believe that you're John the Baptist. Now, in that, from a Jewish perspective... The Messiah in, in Old Testament is going to be preceded by someone who's going to call out and herald the arrival of the Messiah. And we know that to be John the Baptist. So Jesus, in, in Jewish people believing that Jesus is John the Baptist, they're not believing that he's the Messiah. They're believing that he is the one pointing us to the Messiah. See the difference? Which is why Jewish people today, they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They're still waiting on the Messiah. <coughs> who do people say that I am? Well, there are people who say you're John the Baptist. Okay. Other people think you're Elijah. One of them chimes in in Scripture. In the Old Testament, uh, you'll remember that Elijah, was he didn't die. He went to heaven in a whirlwind. And in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, the return of Elijah is recorded in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So they're looking at Scripture, they're looking at prophecy that says that this prophet Elijah is going to return uh, before the day of the Lord comes. So there are people who say you're Elijah. Again, they don't think you're the Messiah. They think you're the one who's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Okay. Others contribute. I've heard people say that you're Jeremiah. Again, another Old Testament prophet. 
Others say, I've heard, I've had people tell me that you're one of the other prophets who's come back to life. Okay. Now look at all of those answers in the context of what Jesus had just warned them about. Don't be misguided. Don't let the misguided opinions of others be yeast in your thinking and your beliefs. Don't get off track. You guys know the right answer. He just finished telling them that, right? So who do those people say? And well, there are people who believe this and there are people who believe that. And he's like, you're proving my point. And then Jesus asks this next question. Who do you say I am? Now watch. This is this important not only today but next week? Jesus does not ask them who they think he is. He asks them who they say he is. It's an important distinction because then, like today, many people will have a belief faith. They believe in Jesus in their minds, but they don't have the faith that allows them to tell other people with their mouths about Jesus. Yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm just not a fanatic about it, right? I keep my opinion to myself. Jesus leans in and he goes, who do you guys say I am? Not who do you guys think I am. Who do you guys say I am? And I'm guessing at this point the disciples are probably looking around at each other. Remember when he said, who do other people say that I am? They all had an answer. That's all really good. Who do you guys say I am? Quiet. Quiet. <coughs> Probably crickets. And at this point, I get this picture that the disciples are all looking around at each other because no one wants to give the wrong answer, right? No one wants to look silly in front of the others, and no one wants to look silly especially in front of Jesus. And we do that too. I ask questions from the pulpit and I ask you to give me answers at different times. And when I do, many of you have some answer that comes into your mind, right? But when that happens, you don't let it come out of your mouth because you're afraid you might be wrong and others will look down at you. So you just sit in silence with the thought that you're afraid is wrong. Or worse, when that happens to you, you, others, by, you're afraid that when you say the wrong answer, others will know that you don't have all the answers. So the safe play is to let someone else answer the question. Right? I'll be safe. I'll sit here. As long as I don't say anything, nobody can understand, nobody will figure out that I really don't know. And Simon, son of Jonah, Jesus identifies him. Not that Jonah, by the way. Simon, son of Jonah, leans forward with his answer, and it's recorded in verse 16. You are the Messiah, Simon says. The son of the living God. Your Bible, your version may say that his answer is you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, you guys, who do all these people out there, who are they telling you? What are you hearing on the street as to who I am? Oh, well, you're John the Baptist or you're Jeremiah or you're Elijah or you're one of the other prophets. 
who do you say that I am? You're the, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. And I'm guessing at this point, after he says that, everyone's looking around and everyone's waiting on a response. Right? Is he right? Is he wrong? Is he way off base? Is he close? And Jesus responds, and his response is recorded in verse 17, beginning in verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. You're right, Jesus says. But look at why he is blessed with the right answer. Okay? For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Remember the early discussion about the weather that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees? He told them that they didn't need to feel the rain and the wind to know that, that bad weather was coming. He, did, he told them that they didn't necessarily need to feel the sun on their face to know that good weather was coming. Their experiences and their knowledge would lead them to a conclusion based on all the evidence that they had experienced. That's what he told them. And sitting around the fire that night, he looks at all of those guys that have been following him around for years and he goes, who do you say I am? Because I haven't told you. Consider the evidence. Weigh the evidence. Look at what you've seen. Think about what you've seen. Think about what you've heard. Think about how you feel. Based on all of that, who do you say I am? Based on everything I see, you're the Messiah. You're, you're the Christ. Blessed are you, Simon, because I didn't have to tell you for you to figure that out. Here, Simon uses what he's seen and experienced to come to the only conclusion that would possibly make sense to him. Jesus, the man sitting around the fire with him. Jesus, the man who he saw feed 5,000 people with a couple of loaves of bread and a few fish. Jesus, the man who healed sick people and made lame people get up and walk. That Jesus, the only possible conclusion was, at least to Simon, that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Savior. Jesus was God's Son. It's the only answer that makes any sense based on what I've seen and what I've experienced. There was only one possible answer to the question. And the only issue at hand at that moment was Simon believed it in his heart, but would he say it with his mouth? And he did. Again, not who do you think I am, but who do you say I am? And what happens next after he says that sentence? What happens next changes the entire world from that moment all the way until now. And we will look at that more closely next week. Because you can't be here for three or four hours while I do all of this. That statement changes the entire world. That statement changes you today at 10, at 11.02 on Sunday morning. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God.
today, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, from someone who's always been in church to someone who's just trying to figure it all out, I believe that we are all faced with that same thought to contemplate. Who was Jesus? Who do you say I am? Not only who was Jesus, but who is Jesus. And in His way, I believe that we are asked that same question that Jesus asked that night. Who do you say that I am? You may believe in me, but are you brave enough to tell others what you believe? Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, or 32 records Jesus saying, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Your version may use the word confess, but it's a core question for each of us. I believe it's a core question for each of us each and every day. Who do you say he is? Because if you're not willing to tell other people who he is, then you shouldn't be surprised when Jesus doesn't tell His Father who you are. Based on everything that you have seen around you, based on everything that you see around you today, if someone asks you about this Jesus guy, what are you going to say? How are you going to answer? And based on a lifetime of evidence... Personally, I believe that there's only one answer. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. He's not some prophet come back to life. He's not some foreteller. He's not some crazy guy. Based on everything I see today, Everything I have seen in my life, even before I wasn't a believer, there really only is one answer to that question. Who do people say that, who do you say that I am? <coughs> you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And perhaps today is the day that your heart is telling you that you need to share that publicly for the very first time. If that's the case, then I invite you to come forward during our invitation hymn and share that decision with me and with others. Perhaps you feel like you've moved away from Jesus in your relationship and you need to rededicate yourself to restoring that closeness. Or maybe you want to officially join in the fellowship of this church. Or, or, or maybe all of this is just so completely confusing to you that you need to talk with someone. You need to pray about it, and that's okay. There are people who want to pray with you and people who want to pray for you. And we ask that you seek them out if you need to. We have a prayer room right over there. There are people in there before church, during church, after church. If you need to pray, somebody's going to be there to pray with you and pray for you. It is a central question, not only to what happened next in this journey recorded in Scripture, but it's a central question that each of us needs to answer. And based on our answer, it changes everything about our future. Who do you say I am? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you for this day. I, I, I thank you for this, this word. Father, it's just so important. We, we, we've, we read this piece of scripture over and over and over again, but, but it's so vital, not only then, but it's vital to us today. Just believing is not enough. You also call us to tell other people. You call us to be part of the church. You call us to be part of your family. Father, I know how scary it is to somehow and sometimes answer these questions because you're, we're all afraid that we're going to be wrong. We're afraid that people are going to laugh at us. We're, we're afraid that, that people are going to challenge us. We're, we're afraid that in the end we're going to do more harm to your kingdom than good. 
Help us to see, Father, that that you're not going to allow your word to come back void, that, that you're going to use all opportunities, you're going to use all occasions, you're going to use all discussions to your glory. We just need to be willing to be a part of those. Father, if there's somebody here today who, who needs to confess that with their mouth, they need, they, they've carried it in their hearts and they've carried it in their minds, something's held them back from from openly saying I I want to be part of your family I want to be part of this movement I want to be part of of your eternity then I ask father that you place a boldness in their heart this morning they would come to you and that they would openly acknowledge the greatest decision they could ever make (coughs) father we love you we're honored by your presence here today And we ask these things, Father, in your Son's name and for his sake. Amen.